Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Global Issues on Al Hikmat TV 24 7 online. It is indeed a pleasure and a blessing to have with us in Al Hikmat studio Sister Amanda Smith. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm very honored to be invited. It's always a pleasure to have you with <laughs> us here in Al Hikmat studio. And I know we have a very interesting topic we're going to talk about today, but let me. Um, update our viewers, Sister Amanda has a BA in International Studies and she also likes to carry this in her background that she has, a, she's a speech pathology student. So she loved that speech thing. Yeah, and absolutely. That is interesting and speech is a blessing from Allah. SubhanAllah. It's a gift from Allah. SubhanAllah. Um, Sister Amanda is also a member of the Islamic Jafariya Association in Miami, Florida. We are very blessed to have her with us in the studio. And to all you viewers out there, welcome to the show. Uh, it is a blessing again to have you and have her and for us all to have a very interesting global discussion. And today we're going to discuss with Sister Amanda Smith as a young person in hijab, living in the West, some areas of advice and recommendation and experience from her side. So let us know, Sister uh, Amanda, as a person living in the West, what would you tell our sisters about getting a job in the Western society? What should they look for? What kind of job should they get? What should they expect and not expect and accept, etc.? Well, you know, I think, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, Muslim women have a lot of opportunities, right? When, when they want to look for a job, Muslim women are some of the most educated demographic in, in the United States, mashallah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, you know, women should definitely go out, look for work. There's nothing negative about that Islamically, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I think that is really important for Muslim ladies to know when they go out to work is to understand what their rights are Islamically. So one thing that I've observed a lot of people who, who know that I'm from this country, I'm an American, they'll ask me, they'll say, you know, Sister Amanda, my boss said, you know, I have a uniform, I can't wear a hijab, what do I do? Sister Amanda, you know, I, I can't do, you know, my salat anywhere, what do I do? You know, and I think it's very important for sisters to know that they actually have a legal right to religious accommodations wherever they work. So, for example, well, especially in the United States of America, in the United States of America. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They have this right because, you know, our show is broadcasted worldwide, worldwide. That's worldwide. right. Worldwide. So while some countries may be uh, sort of complicated in the rights of people, the laws may be there but they may not legally stand up to their laws. And that's mm. the problem with some of the other countries in the world. But Alhamdulillah, in America, um, nine out of 10 times, you got the legal support of cases like that. Exactly, exactly. You know, even like, you know, big employers like Disneyland and um, Abercrombie and Fitch, right, mm -hmm. were successfully sued for this, right? So one thing that, that I like to remind my sisters when they go out in the workforce and they're nervous about doing their salat on time, during their lunch break or, or wearing hijab and things like that to have to on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to stand up and advocate for your rights. Of course, but what kind of job would you recommend sisters not take <laughs> like that? <laughs> sisters that, not take. That might get a little more, you know, this is so interesting that while we may be discussing the topic of sisters, it really falls under the responsibility of husbands, mm. brothers, parents, fathers, as to what kind of jobs they should guide their daughters, etc., into accepting. And that will also begin from their college career, mm. their university career. Unfortunately, you send this person to college to study one thing, only to realize later on the kind of job that they will get for what they have studied is not applicable and it's mm. not practical for or realistic for a practicing Muslim, and I've seen that, Sister Amanda, mm. people go to college, university, take this phenomenal degree in a very unique field. Then later on, they get married. They become religious, only to realize that career and that um, education that they spend their life studying leads them to a job that does not fit the life of a married person mm. or a Practicing Muslim. 
What do you, what kind of job? I would, I'm, I'm not putting you in a spot, but I being mean, a but sister. I mean, but I'm just looking at so many of our sisters, like a lot of the work that our sisters do. So, for example, we have a lot of Muslim doctors, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of female doctors. I mean, that's definitely a difficult schedule, but if your spouse is willing to work with you, then go for it. I know as a hijabi, I definitely prefer to go to another Muslim doctor right? Because I know that my standards are going to be mm -hmm. understood. There's not going to be a male just invited into the room, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I, I would encourage sisters, you know, whatever job that is going to fit with their standards to think about that before they go into something. But the only thing I'd really so advise people... medicine is definitely not a problem. Medicine is great. Because you have yeah, the choices absolutely. of what limits you can go with, except in emergency cases. Now, there mm. are emergency cases where you have to do what you have to do mm. and the health condition and the Islamic laws of course permit certain times of emergency need um, that uh, a male or female doctor can interact but if it's not like emergency cases and you have choices we, we all know that so yeah, we're not talking definitely. about that yeah. we're not talking about emergencies so we just want to make sure you viewers don't start thinking about emergencies and a life and death situation that is all covered, so we have no problem with that. We're Absolutely. talking about a job, choices, etc. Exactly. I mean, the only thing I would tell my sisters is don't feel like just because, let's say, you live in the United States and you're a minority and you're struggling to feel like you have to choose a job that violates Islamic standards, right? So don't feel like that, you know, you have to choose a job where you're selling alcohol. You know, if you're able to work and, and you know, s try to find other options out there, and there's a lot of other options out there mm -hmm. that are ahead at right? Don't sell yourself, right, to get money here in the dunya. So unfortunately, I've seen a lot of sisters feel like they, they have to go take jobs in stores and things where, where they're selling alcohol, right? You want, they right. have to work for, for organizations that exploit women, unfortunately. Um, and no, we, we don't have to do that. We have our standards. And, and one thing I think that's important to remember, despite the pressures and despite the difficulties of living Islam in this country, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is khayru raziqeen. He's the mm -hmm. one who gives you your rizq. Mm -hmm. No, like, but do you want to be a little more specific in jobs? I know that might put I a mean, few I, of our I sisters. I don't really like. <laughs> it'll put a few of our sisters on a little, a little mental stress, dear. But, for example, what do you think about a a Muslim sister um, taking a course in massage? <laughs> yeah, and that that's a tricky thing, right? You could only have female clients. Yeah. Um, you would have to do it, you know, in an area where where you're also be able to maintain hijab if you have to roll mm -hmm. up your sleeves or something like that. Um, and you also have to think about what type of massages you're going to do, even though yeah. it's with another sister, it's still going to be uncomfortable. There's still levels of modesty of even course, between because sisters. Because of what exists nowadays in the world, the reality of yeah. what exists. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, that's going to, that person, you, you need to think about these things before you jump into it. And that's why, like you that. know, uh, you know, myself discussing this with another brother will not necessarily go down well with sisters. But you as a young <laughs> American Muslim living in the West, they're coming from you is a whole different perspective. So we're talking about if a sister learns proper physical fitness, and she has to work in a gym, for example, she should be training ladies. Yeah. Exclusively. You know. And then be careful, right? Even about how you, you wear your hijab in a gym. Because when you're moving and, and move, you know, exercising around, you might be covered, you might be loose, but you know, your clothing doesn't course, stay in place. Definitely. You know? Yeah. So that that's a very difficult I, thing. I, and that might just be total exposure in a whole different style. No, yeah. but, but these are the things, Sister Amanda, mm. that, you know, you, you're grooming your kids, you're teaching them Quran, you're teaching them to pray, and then suddenly they go into a career that does not fit into the Islamic lifestyle. I mean, yeah, they may think, well, we're living in the West, we should feel free to do whatever we want, but it's not about living in the West, it's about doing what is right. And there's so many other things that a person can do. And I really want to get down into a topic with you today mm. on this show of people getting married young. Mm. Yeah, you, you see my point? Getting yeah. married young, choosing the spouse, some of the benefits of getting married young, girls and boys. And it's not about girls alone because the girls will get married to a boy and both need to work together with compatibility. So a little bit on the job. What are the jobs you see that 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 is not that is recommended but not 
practical in all 100% as you see going on. There should be limits, there should be restrictions. So we talk about a gym, we talk about massage. What else you see out there? You spoke about alcohol. What about dancing? Oh my goodness, <laughs> especially in Miami, right? That's definitely not, not no, the type of job that things, you want. Yeah, but that's something, that it's a very serious issue here. You right? study dancing yeah. in school, now you got to teach people dancing, and then you get married to a practicing Muslim. <laughs> what happens here? Your whole career and studies go down the drain. I mean, the only you would have to just teach only Muslim sisters in a closed environment, right? And, 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 and the then, teaching of the Muslim sisters now of dancing is not to go on stage and dance for other men. You can teach them to dance for their husbands. <laughs> right, and, it, and then even then, what kind of dance are you teaching, right? So it, it's there's a lot of type of dances that even aren't going to be appropriate even between ladies. What type of music are you playing? You know, you need music when you dance. A lot yeah. of music for, for a lot of the popular forms of dance is not something most Muslims, most scholars are going to consider to be halal. Right. Of course. And so and this is something, though, even though like when you first go into study, right, that you're, you're going to start to see these things right away. So if someone wants to be a massage therapist. They know they're going to have to touch people. Right. If someone wants to go in and be a dancer, they, they're going to know that they're going to have music around. And a lot of it's stuff that's not going to be had That's just the reality of the era that we live mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I think one of the key things is is to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're making your life decisions, right? You're correct. To remember where your end goal is. Your end goal in life is not to have a big, wonderful career and then die and have nobody remember it, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the reality. If you focus on your career, then that's all it is. It's gone. As soon as you're gone, it's gone. It's nothing. But if your remembrance, right, is that the point of life is akhirah, right? And you work towards akhirah, the job you pick is something that's going to bring you towards akhirah. A lot of these issues, I feel, will solve themselves. And that's the, 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 the million dollar question, as we would say. Uh, it's not a matter about the massage or the, the gym. W we don't want people to think we are narrow minded people, but we are think you've got to think Islamic. Yeah. Nothing is wrong in dancing, but providing you're dancing for your husband, not in a public show. The right show, time in the right, right place. place. Yeah. Y you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the reason why we're talking about these things, these are some of the things that. It gives an imbalance because on one hand, you want your daughter to be the best of practicing Muslim, but you send her to dance in school. You're okay, you want her to keep fit, but what is going to happen when she gets, she wants a job to be a dancer, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. teach dancing, mm -hmm. you know, and there are many other things like that. And we really don't want to sound negative, but I see these things affecting marriages later on. And the reason why we're talking about this, Sister Amanda, because I want to talk to you today about your, your pick on and your recommendation to sisters and parents, etc., on early marriage mm. or marriage under, at the right time, marriage with the right person, because that's important. You can marry the right person at the wrong time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that could lead in divorce. And you can marry the... But marrying the right person in the right time is important because Absolutely. you may marry in the right time but the wrong person from a cultural point of view. Mm -hmm. And we see this happening in a lot of Muslim countries. And then people attack marriage and say, oh, because you got married young, that's what happened. But maybe you married the wrong person. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the balance comes in Islam because Islam has guidelines. So as we get into Absolutely. those things, a little bit about, you, you, you were talking about the hijab. Mm -hmm. What about the hijab? And girls feeling comfortable out there in wearing hijab, you know, before we get into the marriage topic. I know a lot of my sisters, you know, they're, they're really intimidated by it. So, right, so not only, you know, there's a lot of sisters here who don't know they have the right. Even if they know they have the right, the reason that they don't wear it or they're nervous about wearing it is because they're intimidated to wear it, right? Um, and so one thing that I also like to tell my sisters who um, maybe are immigrants here or less familiar with, with mm -hmm. um, American culture is to understand that, yeah, there's a lot of bigots out there. You know, there's always going to be one person who's going to have an issue and pick a fight. But at the same time, for that one person who, who's a bigot, there's 10 other people who are going to look at you and are going to be curious, right? You do dawa when you go out, dress this way, you know, you bring attention to Islam, you get people thinking. Right. Mm -hmm, Another mm -hmm. thing that I would like my sisters to understand is that American culture is, is a highly individualistic culture. 
right? We are not a communal culture, really, compared to, to a lot of other societies by any means, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. We love rogues. We love people who look different, who dress different. And if you look at a lot of the people that in U American history who are idolized, our mm -hmm, greatest heroes mm -hmm. were a bunch of rebels, right? Yeah. They, they overthrew the British government because they didn't want to pay taxes, you right, know? Right. Um, if we look at some of the big, the big figures in American history, the big figures in pop culture, a lot of them in some way or another are breaking the status quo, right? If anything, the status quo in American culture is to break the status quo. We love it. We love when people do that. So when you go out and you are proud and you are strong dressed in your full hijab or, or you know, however much you want to cover, you know, you actually are, are very American in that sense. And there's a lot of people out there who are going to respect you and are going to appreciate the fact that you're willing to dress differently and to go against the grain that way. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an act of strength and it's it's really, you know, no reason to be afraid to do this. So while that may be one area of concern, I want to believe that a, lo a lot of women do not wear hijab. Well, one is because of the Islamic belief as to how much they believe, how much they understand Islam, how mm -hmm. much they understand the Quran, etc. The second thing is beauty. Let's be real. I mean, beauty. Mm -hmm. As a woman, I want to ask you that question. Do you think, you see, women can be more critical of women than men? <laughs> women will definitely, well, unfortunately, I like what you said. Yeah. But women are, uh, not, not just more, but women are technically, realistically speaking, more critical of women than men are because men it's by nature that men may start looking at the the beauty in women and look at all their education their whatever it is and not see the shortcomings mm -hmm. but would you believe that man his mother will see those shortcomings that he didn't see mm. his sister may see that so i i i, I don't want to put you in a spot here but we're talking on a different issue so women normally will find the fine, fineness of, of fault in another woman. So from a beauty point of view, what do you think about the hijab and a woman? Does a hijab make a woman? The reason why I went through that nine yards of mm -hmm. the, the, the look and the perspective. Do you think a woman looks more beautiful in a hijab or not? Because I am sure most women do not wear hijab. Not so much a fear of anybody in anything. Because... Listen, Christians cover their head with veils. Mm -hmm. Jewish women are very, very, very orthodox Jewish women. They cover themselves. They cover, yeah. There's some even wearing niqab. Yes, yeah. nuns, they cover their heads. So I don't think it's about a, a, a worldly Western pressure. Many women, yes, there are a few who do. And I, I, we don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Many, it has to be because of beauty. You know, in my experience and talk that I hear here and there. What advice can you give to women who suffer that complex of believing that a hijab does not make you look more beautiful? So what I would counsel my sisters who, who feel that way, I would never tell a sister to wear a hijab to become more beautiful or more attractive, right? We'll see some people who might cover their hair, but then sort of saran wrap themselves in very tight clothing. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that's not at all hijab. Right. Mm. Um, but one thing that mm. I would counsel my sister. I, I like that. You want to explain that? Explain that, please. Yeah. For so, so for example, you know, I we'll really see need you to explain that for viewers worldwide because that's a problem I see happening. Yeah. Women wear hijab, and when the hijab is to really do certain things about cover your modesty, um, uh, and when I mean to 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 enli en enlighten modesty into you, they tend to use it. <laughs> for some other reason the opposite way you yeah. know and we'll even see now that hijab is starting to become more mainstream we see a lot of like models and a lot of big you know agencies putting hijab out there that really isn't hijab it might be a piece of fabric on the head right but the clothing is very tight the clothing is designed in a way that is is meant to attract attention of the opposite gender so they're which using is the hijab for the opposite purpose for the opposite purpose right which which is something that we as muslims should be standing against and we should be telling these people hey like this is that. this is not a hijab you know, but one thing I would counsel my sisters is that the those who feel that maybe the hijab might make them less beautiful or it's, it's something like a self-esteem issue that they don't want to cover is that when you do cover, 
it actually will improve your self-esteem because what it does is it takes the idea of beauty away from the hands of other people, away from the perspectives of others, right? And it grants you control in it. And that's one of the big reasons why I wore hijab. I wore hijab when I was still an atheist. I wore hijab for you a year kidding. before I became Tell Muslim. Us about that. Tell yeah, us about that. so what do you what, mean that you wore so hijab when you were an atheist? I was in so I your your viewers not to confuse your viewers. Last time we mentioned how I was originally a Mormon. Um, when uh, I and I feel you should explain that. So for viewers out there, you know, Sister Amanda Smith, she was on our show before, and we spoke a little bit about her life, history, and background. We did not talk about that on this show. Uh, so those of you who have not seen that show, you can uh, Google us, Amanda Smith on Al Hikmat, and you will find that on YouTube, uh, and how she was a Mormon before, an atheist at one point say a few words on that so your impression and understanding will not get disturbed in any way <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, absolutely. let us know a little bit about that so people yeah. are, that's right, fascinating so tell in. us about yeah, that yeah so what happened was is so i i was a mormon um i left the church when i was a teenager mm -hmm. um and i i you know did a lot of research a lot of religions but i decided i didn't believe any of so them at one point in time you never believed in god no no i didn't so for a lot but in in one way it, it was good mm -hmm. um because as as dr zakir naik likes to say an atheist is half a muslim there is no god i just need to add but God yes right yes. so so you know for me it was it was a way to sort of get some of my older notions out and it helped me see perspective of a very different group of people that helps me as a Muslim today I understand the mindset of secular people um, much better than than if I hadn't been a part so you a were always that community. a seeker and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, and alhamdulillah, nadi hada, nadi hada. You know, I'm so happy to, to be here. So, so how did you <laughs> wear this hijab while you were an atheist or a Mormon? So what happened was in my last year of college, um, I studied Arabic in college, and I just had a very good friend, mashallah, who was very simple in her hijab. She wore an abaya every day, mm -hmm. very simple wrap. And there was one day I saw her uh, just walking on campus, and subhanAllah, I just felt this shock go through me and I thought, wow, she looks like a princess. And I just started to have dreams about hijab and I started researching hijab. And when I learned about how it works, how you take it off in front of your male family members and your husband, I realized as an atheist feminist, how much control hijab gives women as opposed to, to you know, the neoliberal sort of secular viewpoint, a lot of the viewpoint that a lot of feminists now mm -hmm. are, are putting out, right? it gives other people so much more control over mm -hmm. how I look when you show a lot of skin, right? I have to be dependent on other people choosing to look away or other people choosing not to use me as their sex object when they look at me, when they interact with me. Mm -hmm. Whereas where when I wear hijab, I take that realm of control away from them making the choice that they should make, which Islam says you should make no matter how a woman's dressed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes the realm of control away from them making the right choice and I cover and I send the message that, hey, this is the way you treat me. And as an atheist feminist, I felt like that was so incredibly pow empowering. And so I actually started to cover. I covered for a year before I took my shahada. Um, and it drastically improved my self-esteem. So I used to think I was very fat. I was about the same weight that I am mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized I was just wearing clothes that didn't fit me very well. You know, clothes that, that were too tight because that's what the style is. You need to show so much, right? But really that your body isn't really meant to be that way. You're not meant to be wearing tight clothes like mm -hmm. you're wrapped up in, in plastic wrap. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I sometimes always wonder <laughs> how do these people move around with these tight clothing you can't how do they even <laughs> get how do they how do they even get into an aircraft toilet that is uh, that's a nightmare it's difficult it's uh, difficult so actually why do they stress yeah. themselves out only to let the world see them thinking that it's something nice when it's so uncomfortable so you know coming from a person like you an atheist feminist Fallen in love with hijab? How wow, I mean, that's an interesting message to a Muslim woman. And I'm sure when you saw that woman in hijab while you're an atheist, you see, we don't want our viewers to think, oh, yeah, Muslim woman telling you about hijab. It could be biased. Mm. But here is an atheist feminist looking at a woman in hijab and just fell in love and think that she looks like a princess. Isn't that you? I mean, I was listening yeah. to you what you said, yeah. which meant that she looked beautiful. It was attractive, but yet 
it was not that physical attraction. Exactly. That exposure mm. that Islam, Islam covers with the hijab, but you see an inner beauty. You see some kind of modesty, uh, some kind of, you see a real feminine person. Exactly. Yeah, and she just, she just looked regal and elegant and just, just a very high class sort of individual. You know, yes. it's a very different sort of beauty as opposed to the kind of beauty that, that mainstream media here really wants you to portray. Right here, it's just about attracting the opposite gender and these short-term relationships and, and having lots of people want you. Where in Islam, it's a lot more about who you are, you know. And it's harder for people to pick at you if you're wearing tight clothes. People can say, "Oh, she looks so fat in those jeans," and that's exactly what happens, you know. Of course, of course. Um, so <laughs> it, don't it, even it, talk about <laughs> the shoes. Sometimes I wonder <laughs> why would people make themselves so uncomfortable with the high in the shoes? kind of shoes they yeah. wear. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and the purpose of those shoes is just to attract attention, but that someone can look at you in those same shoes and say, oh, she looks so ugly. And someone can look at me in hijab and say, hey, I look so ugly. But the difference is, is that the way I'm dressing sends a message that my beauty is for myself and that my beauty is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the famous saying goes, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. SubhanAllah. So if the beholder is a person of God consciousness, of modesty, of dignity, of some line of spirituality, class, professionalism, they will see beauty in a woman who is dressed with a hijab. SubhanAllah. You see? SubhanAllah. And um, a woman dressed in hijab, I think it is so beautiful and it is so much, and I'm forget about the spiritual side. The spiritual side we know and, 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 and we understand. But we want to be real because this is what our ladies out there have a problem with, our girls. They really think that it does not represent beauty. Whereas the hijab is such a beautiful thing. And go back, going back to history, Sister Amanda, mm. if you go back into history and you look at the woman in the times, whether in biblical movies, in historic movies and times, women look more elegant in robes with their heads covered, with, this, with the veil. Royalty is always covered up. X, I like that. Mm -hmm. They look more royal. Mm -hmm. They look more elegant. So it, it does not make sense. When someone tells me, oh, the exposure is about beauty and Islam oppressed the woman. And elegance and royalty has always been covered up. It looks so special, so unique. Uh, the words you use as a as a atheist feminist, you saw the woman look like a like a, like princess. a princess, subhanAllah. You know, and I think that's the point a lot of our women miss. And yeah. I wish that you could, you could let people know that. Uh, unfortunately, what has happened with this, the dress code of women, a lot of the men pressure women to dress Islamic from a cultural point of view. Really from a kind of selfish point of view. From a kind of covering up point of view. From a kind of forceful point of view. So the woman now, as human beings, they rebel by not wanting to dress like that. Mm. But in any language, any country, if a woman is really told about the modesty, the beauty, the princess look, the royalty look in dressing with an Islamic wearing, mm -hmm. and, and well, let me put it like this, an atheist feminist will want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> like that. yeah, and I'm not the only one. There's actually a lot of non-Muslims out there, women who have started wearing hijab. Uh, and that's why that uh, exact uh, thing. Uh, what you have just said, you know, that is so valuable to a Muslim woman in the world there, that if he, uh, uh, a Muslim woman dressed in Islamic garb could have attracted an atheist feminist, why won't it be beautiful and attractive to a Muslim woman? SubhanAllah. Inshallah, you know, I pray that it gets easier for women who have gotten tricked into thinking that they don't need to wear it, that they don't want to wear it. Um, and then those issues of self-esteem, when shaitan whispers to you, oh, you're going to look so ugly, you know. Inshallah, I pray my sisters have the strength to overcome that because there's so much ni'mat that comes from following the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, Sister Amanda, we have been speaking for almost 25, 30 minutes. SubhanAllah. So, so we got to go on a short break. When we come back, and I want to let the viewers know that when we come back, we want to touch this marriage at a young age. So we're touching Inshallah. some interesting topics because men talking these things is what people hear all the time on mm -hmm. the sermons, on uh, the lectures, 
you, you see what I'm saying? So women mm. and boys and girls and young people think, oh, this is a hardcore shake on Imam giving you that message. Oh, my radical parents. But hearing it from a young girl like you, a young person like you, in hijab, living in the West, I think your message to our sisters, our parents and our people out there in the West, and even in the East, because a lot of people in the East are now following this pattern of the Western world in delaying marriage, procrastinating marriage. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear from you and I would like you to share to our audience what are your recommendations, what you think, what is your experience in talking to other women out there as to when is the best time to get married. Inshallah. So stay tuned. When we come back after the short break, we'll be talking to Sister Amanda Smith on marriage in the right time. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Assalamu alaikum. Allah gives hikmat, wisdom to whomsoever He wills. And whomsoever is given wisdom is certainly given a lot of good. Only the people of understanding will benefit from the reminder. Tune in to Al Hikmah TV for kutbas, lectures, and Islamic reminders. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Global Issues on Al Hikmah TV 24 7 online. And once more, it is indeed a pleasure and a blessing again to have with us in Al Hikmah studio Sister Amanda Smith. Welcome to the show. Thank again. you so much. I know we had an interesting conversation before we went on the break. I hope we don't have some critics on that dancing and gym and massage thing. But that's the reality. That's well, why like we are that. on the show so people can benefit get some guidelines and rather than waste their life in the the wrong way and Absolutely. misunderstanding they can sort of program their life and plan things in a more professional progressive and realistic way within the fold of islam Inshallah. so as we promised our viewers before we went on a break marriage in the right time what do you look at marriage in the right time to be so one thing that that i've observed you know a lot of masjids a lot of parents will come to me and they'll say, Sister Amanda, how do I explain to my son or my daughter why they don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Or I've even had sisters say, you know, my, son or my daughter has a boyfriend, my son has a girlfriend, they don't want to break up, what do I do, how do I handle this, right? And so this is something that, that's a very big issue. A lot of the youth, especially the ones that are in the public schools, right, are going there. And what age are we talking about there? So we're talking about teenagers, wow. right? Or even young adults, so like a lot of kids going to college, right? Once they're, they're away from their parents and they're a little bit more free, they start falling into this trap. So, so parents officially, formally condone and accept the fact that our teenage daughters and sons have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I wouldn't say generally that they're condoning it, right? Okay. But generally that a lot of parents just don't know how to handle it, right? Okay. A lot of parents are coming to me and say, how do I teach my daughter how to do it? How do I convince my daughter that she shouldn't have a boyfriend? She said she loves him. You know, this is something constantly I have parents come talk to me about. But I think there are some who just think it's part of society. There are so, some, which is unfortunate. It's very unwise. So some parents may want to know how to handle it. But what about those parents who think that it's part of society, it's part of growing up, and it's a natural way of life, and they don't see it to be an issue? So, so we're not even talking about them. Oh, no. But I mean, but, but this is what, what I think is really important for mm -hmm. people here um, who, who didn't go through the public schools here, right? Mm -hmm. And so don't really understand what the dating model is in mm -hmm. American society, right? And I feel like if that's understood, then it's much easier to understand how to, to really combat this problem amongst our youth. Mm. Right. So, I mean, the dating model, right, it's normally based on just physical attraction or or superficial things like liking the same um, music, liking the same movies, having, you know, a similar kind of personality. Right. Very rarely. Right. Will, will a couple that are teenagers, or even college, start dating and get together because they think that other person is going to be a good lifetime partner. They're not going to think that person is responsible. That person has similar religious values. In fact, it's actually seen as a very bad thing. So if someone if a boy and a girl in American culture start dating and getting to know each other and one of them asks hey you know what do you think about children do you want to have children in your future that scene is very scary right and that's something a lot of Americans will see as a red flag and go running 
Whereas in the Muslim community, the way we typically go about marriage, that's one of the first things you ask, right? Mm -hmm. It's important. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have children, right? And that's that's for you. That's a perfectly normal thing to ask the but first time course. you meet, you know. But that's natural. And, and it's it's natural, but and it makes sense because that's practical. Because our goal is is marriage. It's the practical aspect there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of people they don't understand, right, that it's starting off this way, and that the, even though in the American mindset the attention is to eventually find their lifetime partner, their model takes many many years to go about it. And the primary focus of that model is just to decide whether or not you love that person. A lot of people were really influenced by Disney movies and, and popular culture that says that you're in love. Everything is going to turn out all right and there won't be any problems and you're going to live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our young teenagers and a lot of our college students will worry more about, hey, do I love this person? I love her. Let's make it work. Or I love him and we're going to live happily ever after, right? And it's not until, say, you know, years and years and years down the road, right, where someone's going to realize, hey, this person actually is really bad with money. This person is very irresponsible or or this person has different religious values from me. There's no way we could, you know, spend an entire life together. There's no way we could have children together. But do together. you think the young people figure those things out when they're... In love. When they're young, right, when you're young, it's very easy to get wrapped up in that and not be able to see the long term, you know. And so what's important is actually to explain to our kids. And that is what love is blind means. That is what love is blind is mean. And it's really difficult. And that's why there's a lot of hikmah in Islam when people will look at Muslims and say, why do you separate the girls and the boys so much, right? Mm -hmm. It's to protect the boys and the girls from that natural blindness that's going to occur. What I personally think is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that so that way if we are married in the Islamic fashion, those new marriages when we're getting married, you know, early, when we're getting married when we're when we're badil, right? That you're gonna have that really strong bond to start with and grow together with this very strong bond. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the American dating model, after a while that initial very strong bond that you're gonna experience when you first interact with somebody is gradually gonna go away. And after a while, as the years go by and you've been burned and you've broken up with this girlfriend and that boyfriend over and over and over, gradually that initial strong bond feeling you're going to have will disappear. So many a times, many a times what happens in these um, marriage dating style, because a lot of time the purpose is about marriage, mm. sometimes not. <laughs> and the dating is all about marriage or not marriage. But what happens is not about a ma marriage of two people coming together to produce a family. It's about two career com careers coming together. It's about jobs. It's about infatuation. It's about wealth. Mm -hmm. Someone is attracted to another person by their wealth, their career, their job. And then when they get married, only to realize that that is not even part of the building of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now they're looking for the divorce because they married for the wrong reason. And that's something our Holy Prophet, right, taught us. You know, yes. he taught us that we should be looking for deen, right? Yes. Spirituality, if you have that piety. Same, exactly. Taqwa. If you have that same taqwa, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you guys have the same level of taqwa and that's your focus, then inshallah, you know, you're going to have a better marriage. It's going to have a better foundation. But, you know, this problem of, of dating and just, you know, getting involved with the wrong person or getting attached to the wrong person too early, right? It leads, right, to, to it always leads to a bad end. There's always a chance your marriage might end in divorce. You never know what will mm -hmm, happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's always a guarantee that your boyfriend or girlfriend will end in a breakup because that's what the model's designed to do. It's designed to have fun now and then no commitments later. So normally people would look at, um, yes, the person's family background, the would, but then that no, is not a hundred percent guaranteed because a lot of people marry the person they love and they really don't care what family they came from it does not matter if they even have a family all right then some people marry because of wealth in the family of the person they're seeking or the person that person themselves or beauty and those are things that people would look for family background beauty finance and finance will come under career profession job occupation but as you rightly said in islam we were taught by the prophet peace be upon him to look for spirituality piety and really and truly sister amanda if, if people would let god and we we have a lot of non-muslim viewers that look at our shoes uh, sometimes i want to be very neutral 
non-Muslims because you know we do a lot of shows with non-Muslims, with rabbis, with priests, with business people of different career and different professions. So they they normally look at our shows before they come on the talk show. So God should be that person, that central, common ground in a relationship. Exactly. So if a person looks at that spouse to be from a godly point of view from Allah's point of view for the pleasure of Allah and loves that other person for the love of Allah then because of the love of Allah in that person the person will see the love and qualities of Allah in the other person subhanallah but when subhanallah. you don't yeah but when you don't have that Allah's vision that godly vision in your mind and your heart and you're not looking for that then you see everything opposite to that mm -hmm. and if you find that the other person is also looking for the same thing. So when you get married, you have a bond of a godly spiritual relationship because you did not look for the other things, but automatically the love comes in, the beauty, the profession, the career, and you build this world SubhanAllah. when you're younger. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Isn't that so? And a lot of people are afraid to get married young. So in this region of the world, the, the common cultural conception and is that you, think you should to get wait, married. you know, because uh, there's a lot of myths out there. So, for example, a lot of people think that once you're married, life is over. And again, I think this is a lot of greatly due to the dating model where you spend so, once you marry, so many years. Life is over. Yeah. But that's what about how getting married think. and building life? And starting that's that's the Islamic perspective, right? And that actually makes a lot more sense when you stop to think about it, when you observe other societies that, that go about it that way. Your marriages are stronger, your families are stronger, people, you know, have a better quality of life. Whereas in the West, a lot of people are depressed, a lot of people are very lonely, but they still have this mindset that if I get married, I'm not going to be able to finish school, I'm not going to be able to get a good job, I'm not going to be successful, I'm just going to be trapped here, not going to be able to do anything. Right? When reality, if you're with another person, there are studies that show that married college students do better than single ones. Right? Of course, because now you're not distracted by the opposite sex. You're not distracted anymore. And you're right? not wasting unnecessary money and with the opposite sex. Exactly. Exactly. And you have a support system. You have that stronger support system. You have your human needs filled. We need companionship. Of course. So allow yourself that need. Fill yourself your need. In so you don't have to look for that companionship. You don't have to look for it and end up in bad relationships that were based on superficial things. Right? I like that point you made. You know, you know mm -hmm. a lot of girls, when I ask them, why aren't you married? They say, we have not found the right person. So my next question is, why are you with the wrong person in the meantime? So, in the, so they did not find the right person. But in the meantime, they were the wrong person. And it, you, people waste years of their life, you know, with this. They know it's the wrong person, but they're emotionally attached to that person and they don't want to let them go. And that's why they don't get married. Now, why are you mm. not getting married? Well, we did not find the right person. So they have wasted their life. And then now they're looking to get married at the age of 30, which is when they now want to begin their life. So mm. in, in, re in, in the real life, you have wasted 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's so much you could have done. You can travel with your spouse. No one wants to travel alone. You can still travel. You can still, you'll do better in school. You mm -hmm, can still mm -hmm, work. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's the beginning of life where your needs are actually fulfilled and you're, you're more complete as a person that way. Financially, how do you see it for a person marrying at a younger age? Well, there's, there's a myth. No, no we know that mm -hmm. we already discussed at a younger age is one thing, but you need mm -hmm. to marry the right person at a younger age. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people blame, and I hear that sometimes on talk shows, or they blame marriage at a young age for the reason of divorce. But it's not that. It's because you married the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Married the right person mm -hmm. in the right time. Mm -hmm. So from a financial point of view, a person studying, or a person younger, right age, right person you got, from a financial point of view, which is one of the questions everybody got, how is going to happen financially? What is your take on that? Well, the Holy Quran says that if you want to get married, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enrich you. So again, if you need to get married, don't think, oh, I'm poor, so I need to be stuck in this situation where I might accidentally fall into sin and create a fitna for myself, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enrich you. There
There's also a myth a lot of people think when you get married, your life expenses are going to double, but mm -hmm. that's not true, right? So if you're living somewhere, you're paying rent, you're still paying the same amount of rent, it's just someone is now living with you, mm -hmm. right? Um, groceries, you're not buying double the amount of groceries. Mm -hmm. The way people buy groceries, a lot of time you can share them. Fortunately, you know, sometimes food gets thrown away because you don't eat through everything that you bought. Groceries, the grocery bill's not gonna double. It's gonna go up a little bit, not much. Utilities aren't gonna double. You don't use twice as much electricity. Two people in the, in the same room use the same amount of electricity. It might go up a small bit because now we've got our own personal devices. But it's not going to be a really big drastic jump like people imagine. You don't need double your income to be married. Maybe just a small bit. But then at the same time, you're going to be able to be more productive. Again, because your, your normal human needs are being met, you're going to be more productive. You're mm -hmm. going to do better in school. You're going to do better in work. You're going to have a support system. You're going to have an easier time finding a job. Your network doubles. That's the one thing that your does double. Doubles, your yeah. network doubles. And, and you have companionship. Yeah, you're happy. exactly. You're happy most of all. You're so happy. You're relaxed. You have, you have help. You have assistance in each other and trusted assistance because you have that compatibility and you're relaxed and you, you go to the restaurant. One meal will be enough to share. You can buy exactly. a variety of things and not waste. So financially, exactly. we see it even working out SubhanAllah. if a person gets married younger to the right person. SubhanAllah. Yeah, there's no reason to unnecessarily delay it. Absolutely. No reason. So None. You would have been wasting life. Exactly. That exactly. is interesting. And, and last, before we go, I know we got to go. We're on a time countdown here right now. We got a couple minutes again. What do you think of having someone, a neutral person, who could be like a, uh, an advisor, who could do some recommendation for the spouse that a person intends to choose? I see there's a lot of hikmat in that method. So again, in, in American culture, that's, that kind of method is frowned upon. A lot of people see that as something, oh, immature, you're dependent on another person. But actually, if you really look at how it works, there's a lot of hikmat because it protects you from making decisions based on love goggles. Mm -hmm. You're able to see more clearly. You're able to find out things about that person that they might not show you. So And that you cannot see. And that you cannot because see. Because love is blind. Because love is blind. So this neutral uncle, auntie, teacher, sheikh, elderly person, more mature, they may see that you can't see. That's what you're seeing. Exactly. They're going to see what you can't see, and they're going to be able to investigate for you in ways that you might not feel comfortable yourself, especially, you mm -hmm. know, it's good to have like a sister that. ask other sisters about her. Have you seen her get angry? How does she behave? How does she conduct herself? What is her home like? You know, the, these important sort of questions, it's easier for a sister to investigate. Muslims, we do background checks. We actually vet people, you know, a whole lot more than a lot of people would vet their boyfriends or girlfriends. Right. <laughs> a lot of people aren't going to know about their backgrounds. A lot of people before they start dating and having relationships with that person will not have found out how they behave when they're angry. So they're already emotionally attached to someone that they don't know how they act when they're angry. But as Muslims, when we have that advocate who's willing to go and investigate for us and find out really what's going on, we're able to know a lot more about that and, and person right before we're attached to that person. The right advocate. The right advocate. As you <laughs> may have the wrong person <laughs> recommending someone to you. Yeah. And that person may have ulterior motives. Mm. The person may not be God conscious. Mm. So they will see the wrong values. Mm. So what you're saying, if someone sees someone that they like, get an advocate, a middle person who could do some background check on that Who's person. Who's going to see things, right, the way that you're looking. So, for example, a sheikh is going to look, you know, Islamically, one of your parents. Your parents are going to know you better than you know you. You know, even me as a non-Muslim, I had uh, my stepfather helped me. I asked his opinion. Um, Are you kidding? Yeah, you I kidding? did. I did, and he was really, actually, very happy about and it. And of course, he would want to make sure you get the right person. He, yeah, you know, honestly, I think my dad, you know, would have picked for me better than I would have picked for me. You know, because you know he cares about me so much. He's the one who raised me. My birth father has has passed away now. Right. You right. know, so so yeah, he, he he you know his recommendation, him saying, you know what, this seems like a good guy. I'm okay with it. Did a lot to tell me that I don't have love goggles on. Right. That this is someone who actually is going to be a good person for me, be a good fit because he knows me better than I know me. Interesting. And sometimes yeah. you may not be attractive to someone, but the mere fact that that an elderly person around can tell you the good of this person and all the nine yards about that person. When you see that person, 
with that in your mind, it builds an attraction and then you start liking the person. Or you might see someone you totally love, but that neutral person will be able to guide you along to let you know, listen, you love just what you see, but they're a big package and baggage that comes with that, which will delete all that love very soon. Mm -hmm. So that is phenomenal. That is unique. Thank you very much, Sister Thank you so uh, Amanda. Much. It has been fantastic talking to you. Alhamdulillah. And on this show, global issues. And I think this is a major global issue anywhere in the world. Absolutely. I know we mentioned a lot about the West and the West. But why we want to mention the West? Because these were not the values in the East and the Far East once upon a time. Mm. But unfortunately, the East and the Far East and the Muslim countries are all following this Western lifestyle. That's unfortunate. And it's exactly yeah. the same thing happening across there delaying marriage marrying the wrong person marrying the wrong time it is a major disaster in the world a major Absolutely. disaster and i think that is very global mm -hmm. and thank you very much for being on the show thank you so much thank you very much for the sharing your experience one thing will not leave me though the atheist feminist <laughs> that fell in love with the hijab i think that was so unique so that is such a powerful high voltage message to a woman Alhamdulillah. it is really phenomenal thank you very much for being with us in the show again it was a pleasure thank being you. with sister amanda smith who has a ba in international studies a sister who's been around and lecturing to many sisters and brothers and communities she get, she gets a lot of questions from um, a lot of people there, Muslims and non-Muslims. And as we said, she used that fa fantastic statement, an atheist feminist she was once upon a time, and she fell in love with the hijab. So but she loved the Islamic teachings and the Islamic lifestyle. And I think she's an ideal sister to modulate and communicate with some of our sisters out there that will be able to benefit on a realistic lifestyle, especially in the West. Sure. Thank you very much for tuning in. May Allah bless you viewers. 24-7 online. Keep tuned to Al-Hikmah TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.